Okay, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm not, uh, I don't have a mic like uh, David here. <laughs> okay, so my name is Shannon Vossipal. I am the Manager of Data and Information Services at the Arctic Institute of North America. Thank you everyone for coming out today for our speaker series. Um, today our speaker is Dr. David Natcher. Dr. Natcher was trained as a cultural anthropologist. His research interests rest largely in environmental and economic anthropology. He holds a graduate degrees from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the University of Alberta. And he has held faculty appointments at the University of Alaska Anchorage and Memorial University of Newfoundland, both in anthropology. While at Memorial University, he also held a Canada Research Chair in Aboriginal Studies. Uh, Dr. Natcher is currently a professor in the Department of Bioresource Policy, Business and Economics at the University of Saskatchewan, where he also serves as a senior research chair with the Global Institute for Food Security, and he happens to be on sabbatical this year, so we're lucky to get him. Um, David is going to be speaking to us today on the maintenance of indigenous food systems in border regions of northern Canada, and I'm going to stop talking and let him talk since he's the one you're here to listen to. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, thanks for inviting me in. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this. I haven't been back to U of C for about 10 years and haven't been back to the Arctic Institute in North America since Mike Robinson was the director. So it's been a, it's been a few years. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be back and I think what, you know, Mary Beth is, as the new director, it seems like exciting times for the, for the Institute. So I'm really, really, really pleased to, to be here. Uh, and share some of the work that I've been doing. Now, I was asked to submit this abstract, I think, back in November, and there's always that risk where you sit down and write the abstract by the time you get around to actually presenting the work. You know, is it gonna be relevant? And like, oh my God, what did I, what did I submit back in November? <laughs> so when I you know, pulled this out earlier, uh, or last week, saying, okay, yeah, this is, there's still a story to tell here. And I think occasions like this are certainly good for me because I've been kicking this project around for a little bit and trying to tell what, what's the message, what's the, what's the story from this research. And uh, sometimes when you say things out loud and in public, it makes you think about things. So, uh, so this will be an exercise for me. And uh, so I appreciate any feedback you have on this work. Um, it, it, it remains ongoing. What we thought was gonna be a short little project turned into be something uh, far more extensive. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, I'll talk, I think, around you know, 30 or, or 40 minutes around there. And I, I really hope it's a small enough group. So if there's, uh, you know, hopefully there's some questions. And uh, you know, I, I, I talk a little fast. I still have my Pittsburgh accent. So if there's anything that you don't understand or if something I uh, glossed over, please stop me. And I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to clarify it. So, I want to put this in a little bit of context. Uh, I'll get into the, the work that we did up with Old Crow in, in a moment. But between 2012 and 2014, I had the absolute pleasure to be on a, a federal panel to, uh, to look at the issue of food security. I don't know if you remember, but a, a couple years back, the, the UN came to Canada, and Canada got a scathing report on uh, Aboriginal, in particular, Aboriginal food insecurity in Canada. And uh, there was a lot of press, and the Conservative government, uh, you know, they didn't, they responded. And one of the ways they responded was to form this panel, which I guess governments often do. And we created a panel, and I was invited to be on it, and I wasn't sure how I was gonna contribute to it. I never really thought of myself as a, expert in food security by any means. But I saw the other members who were on this panel and there was no way I was not gonna participate seeing people like Henry Huntington and Fickert Burkis, um, Murray Humphreys, people who I just think the, the world of brilliant, brilliant scholars and have a lot of experience. So like how do you pass on an opportunity to be around those people for, uh, for two years? So there's uh, approximately 20 of us on the panel, which is a, a big panel, especially when you're coming from a bunch of different disciplines, uh, when you think you know, your discipline might have all the answers. Um, but we were set, we were given a task. No primary research, review the literature that's out there on food security, Northern Aboriginal food security, synthesize it in some meaningful way. We weren't allowed to make recommendations, but we synthesized the information and tried to present it in a, in a digestible way. 
Now, we were given a page limit, I think, of 180 pages. The final document, I think, was 320, and that was <laughs> really hard. So, but we came together, and uh, it, was a, it was a fantastic experience, but we, we quickly realized um, that in, in many ways we were just talking past each other. You know, um, brilliant biologists, wildlife biologists, uh, other, other people, uh, international law, domestic law. I'm a cultural anthropologist. So we had a bunch of different disciplines trying to grapple with this, this, this uh, issue of Aboriginal northern food security. And how do we do that? Well, w one of the early meetings, we knew if we were going to get anywhere, well, you need a model, right? We need some kind of conceptual model, some kind of diagram. And we probably spent six months trying to figure out this conceptual diagram. And I don't know if this is a good diagram or not. I know the reviewers from the final report didn't think it was necessarily a good diagram, but it got us thinking about how all these different elements of food security kind of interact and influence. And we kept adding to it. And we go, oh, no, we can't add more. we got to take away. And this was the final model. And I don't know if anyone has seen the report. Uh, but it's available online. Uh, but these are the different dimensions that, that we came, came up with. You know, some of the very, you know, traditional um, areas around food, food security, accessibility, access, um, um, whether it's good quality, food safety, those kind of issues. But for the North, there's all these other dimensions that we couldn't, you know, neglect. You know, colonialism what the impact of history on Aboriginal peoples, you know, uprooting people from their traditional lands and putting them elsewhere. And how does that affect food security? Residential schools, where we're actually, you know, testing what malnutrition, the impacts of malnutrition on Aboriginal youth, you know, the, that, that kind of history. So we wanted to capture in some form, you know, colonial aspects of food security. Gender. You know, food security is not experienced evenly across the North. There are certain populations that are more at risk of being food insecure than others. Can we try to capture some of those elements in this report? And I should say there's very, very little, little literature on gender and food insecurity in, in Canada as compared to a lot of the international literature. So a lot of these other areas that we tried to use to kind of, you know, use it as a model, say, okay, how are we going to write this, this, big, this big report? And one of, the, one of the elements that I grappled with in particular was food sovereignty. I mean, everyone agreed that food sovereignty had to be in there. You know, it was a really important dimension of food insecurity. Um, but when I thought about the, the, the complexity and the integrated nature of global food systems, how does food sovereignty actually play out in a community like Nain? Or, or, or Hopedale in Labrador. Are we actually capable of acting as sovereign decision makers when it comes to our food systems? And I have to admit, I really struggled with that because I wasn't convinced that food sovereignty was an issue that we really could address in, in this report. But in the end, everyone was very committed to it and it you know, certainly served as a real core to what we tried to express in, in this report. And the definition that we adopted was this from the World Forum on Food Sovereignty. So the food sovereignty is the ability to define your own policies and strategies for sustainable production, distribution, consumption of food that guarantee the right to food and the, for the entire population. Now most of the communities, none of the communities I work with in the North have that kind of power are able to exercise that type of sovereignty over their own food system. Uh, they're, they're largely responsive to the what's ever shipped into the co-op or, or the northern store. Uh, so I had a hard time grappling with that until I came into this project, until I was invited in by the Vuntuk Wachin to participate with them on a project that they were interested in conducting on their own food security and the impact of the U.S.-Canada border on that food system. And when I went into it, I, I wasn't thinking food sovereignty. I was thinking economic anthropology, I was thinking Aboriginal land rights, I was thinking everything else except sovereignty. And I, I'll get into that now. So, I don't know, I, I use this, this this picture, and I love this picture. It's the, it's the cover of a book that was published back in 2010 
uh, the people of the lakes. And it's a, it's a beautiful collection of narratives of the Gwich'in. And I love this picture. I, like, I really like old, old pictures like this. But I think they have this as the cover of the book, and it, it, I think it's a fabulous picture. Um, but I'm not sure if people are familiar with the Gwich'in people. Uh, their territories extend from western uh, Alaska uh, through the Yukon uh, into the Northwest Territories. Uh, they actually, you know, certainly the Vuntut and some of the Yukon groups uh, were, were contacted very late. Uh, they, they say the Vuntut territory was one of the most inaccessible locations for the fur trade to reach. There's only a couple accessible routes to the, to the uh, Vuntut territory. And this is the territory I'm, I'll be talking about today. So and I don't know if you can see it with the, the lighting, but this is the border. I have some, hopefully, what will look like better maps. But just, this is the, the territory of the, of the Gwich'in Nation. And the Vuntut, like all the other uh, Gwich'in in the territory, occupied this territory in a very seasonal round of movements where they would target uh, caribou at river crossings at certain times of the year, salmon when they uh, came up the rivers, as well as the Old Crow Flats, which was, and I'll show you a picture of the Old Crow Flats today, or part of the Old Crow Flats today, uh, that's being impacted by climate change and other effects. But that was a really important area for ratting and uh, wildlife um, and, and, and waterfowl harvesting. So unbeknownst to the Vuntuk Wachin, the U.S. bought Alaska uh, from, from the Russians back in uh, 1867. And this really wasn't a huge deal for the Vuntuk Wachin, and we, we talked about that. And one of the beautiful things about working with the, the Vuntut, if you go there, they have an amazing archives of oral histories with elders and leaders and community members. And they have captured so much history uh, that's, that's accessible up in the community of Old Crow. And if you're ever, you know, for various types of research projects, it's just a wealth of, of knowledge and, and information to, to to work with. So we went and we, we dug through uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the archives and we talked to people and people said, you know, oh, that, that was no big deal back then with the, the, the border. And, you know, some of the quotes, you know, oh yeah, many didn't even know the border was there. People from Fort Yukon, where I come from, would go ratting in the Crow Flats. So there was this, this real movement uh, back and forth, what was, what was the border. Um, Donald Frost from uh, Old Crow, there was no real border at the time, at least for people like us, which in people would go wherever, wherever you want. And we did a project, I'm not going to talk about it uh, today, but with, within this, we went back and we recorded old residency patterns uh, of Gwich'in elders. And you know, the, the folks, the, the elders in their 70s and 80s, the amount of mobility that they experienced as youth, moving from village to village for different, you know, extended periods of time. You know, we worked with one elder who lived in 22 different villages in his life. So, and now we're talking about, oh my God, you know, uh, Aboriginal mobility in the north. Well, there was a lot of mobility back then. Um, so, you know, maybe we need to be a little bit more critical thinking about tr contemporary mobility patterns. Anyway, so this was, you know, it, when it was first introduced, the border, not, not a real big deal. But as everyone you could expect, that changed. That changed o over time. Um, as the, the U.S. had more of a foothold in, in Alaska, more fur trade companies like Hudson Bay Company moving into the region. In the early 1900s, that's when Old Crow and the Vudtuk Wachin first began to experience, oh, there's a border here, and we can't move across it the way we, we always have, okay? And some of the, the quotes, there was criticisms that all of a sudden government was posing these regulations on, on them for what rabbits to, to muskrat to fish. You know, every time they turned around, there was this, this new law being imposed on them, which was absolutely foreign to their seasonal existence, the way they moved across the land and where they visited with neighbors. From that point on, the, the Vuntuk Wachin continued to experience more and more restrictions uh, on their um, uh, mobility with it within their territory. There's old stories. I'll talk about the social life of these stories. They talk about, you know, meeting game wardens in the community of Circo or Fort, Fort Yukon where the food would be taken from them. 
uh, or equipment would be taken from them. They would be forced to pay some type of uh, access fee to go to the villages and, and visit with neighbors. So it was one thing after another. The events of 9-11 only made these conditions even more pronounced. After 9-11, border crossings were becoming a very serious issue uh, for the Vuntuk Wachin. There's quotes that say, we weren't treated like Wachin anymore, we were treated like anybody else. So they'd be hassled at border crossings. Um, and, you know, it, so that's really what triggered my invitation to come up. Yeah. I'm sorry, so you said um, the quotas as they, the government, um, was that the US government? Both. Both. Yeah. Depending on which way, but certainly uh, in Fort Yukon. That was some of most of the stories and most of the problems because that's the way, the way you would travel through the river system. That, yeah. So back in 2010, I was invited by the Vunta to come up and work with them on this project. And this was one project among many that they were undertaking to address conditions of food insecurity. Another project was working with elders to understand what did you do in times of strain, resource strain? What animals did you target? When caribou weren't available, what did you do? Where did you go and find fish? So they're preparing, and I'll talk about preparing for hard times in a, in, in a little bit. But so my project was, was one of about three that they were addressing on food insecurity. The third was community gardens, so trying to come up with strategies around local food systems. So I was invited up, and uh, it, it, was, it was wonderful because it was a community initiative project. They wanted this done, and we had the pleasure of, of contributing. And myself and Toby Jeans, who's on, on the river, uh, Mr. Frost there, uh, she was a graduate student of mine, and she's now a PhD student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where she, she's doing some work. Norma Caskey, who during a portion of this uh, um, project was the chief of the Vuntuk Wachin, but she's been a real powerful leader in the Yukon for a, for a lot of years, and I was really happy to work with, with someone like an amazing person like Norma. And Glenna Tichlici, right there. The four of us served as the steering committee for this, and we involved the community high school students. They're right in through here and doing this. So we had a group of students who participated in every phase of, phase of the research, which was really cool, particularly seeing them interact with the elders about what it was like to move across the land um, before they were more or less confined to, to the villages. We did household surveys, and all the uh, students were involved in this. And the household surveys talked about you know, where in the past have you lived, how long have you lived there, um, where your family members are, are, are residing, where in the past year or who in the past year have you given or received food from uh, in other communities as well as within Old Crow. Um, we did uh, extensive kind of life history interviews with people about how things have changed in relation to the, to the border. And we had focus groups of elders, trappers, active hunters to talk about how the enforcement of the border ha has changed and how it's impacting them today and what might be done to try to remedy the situation that they to find themselves in. Okay, so I'll just jump into some of these results. Um, this table, and I'm glad it's big, because when I was looking at this on the airplane, the font was tiny, tiny. I'm like, oh, God, no one's going to be able to see this. But I, I think this is pretty, pretty legible. Um, so Old Crow shares food with 17 other communities uh, in the region. Okay, and that, that goes from who you might expect, you know, Whitehorse, uh, to Washington, D.C., down, down here in the bottom. And I said, Washington, D.C., why in the world are you sharing you know, food, caribou, with Washington, D.C.? Someone in Washington, D.C., they say, oh, we do that every year to remind some senators how important uh, uh, the cabin grounds are. So it's a political statement just to remind them some dried caribou being sent to Washington. And uh, you know, I think that's very, very interesting, the power of kind of food and that kind of connection. More significantly, you know, Whitehorse. So, Ties, what, what, what I mean by ties is the individual exchange of food. So I give you 20 pounds of caribou or salmon. That's counted as a, as a tie 
or, or an exchange. And through the surveys, we accounted for 148 different ties or exchanges of food to, to family and friends down, living down in, in Whitehorse. And a lot of people from Old Crow moved down to Whitehorse now uh, for various reasons, employment opportunities, uh, the kids who want to fin finish high school go down, elders move down, um, there's a very active elder community uh, in, in Whitehorse. But that connection through food is, is critically important to maintain a connection to the caribou uh, up, in, up by Old Crow. But over, you know, almost, you know, over 9,300 pounds uh, of predominantly caribou is sent to family and friends down in, in, in Whitehorse. Now, when I, I put this in pounds, and I, I, I suspect that's fine, but when I went up to Old Crow to present this, I had it in kilograms, and everyone's like, how much is that? <laughs> so I, I converted it back to pounds, and I, I'm from Pittsburgh, so I'm used to working in, in pounds, but that's a lot of meat. That's a lot of meat moving from Old Crow, a village of about 300 people, down to support uh, family and friends down in, in, in Whitehorse. And from there, you see uh, Anuvik, you know, they were recipients of, of 2, 000, over 2,000 pounds, and I have it working down. And, and Fort Yukon, you know, they, they sent out 1,600 pounds, and they received a little over 600 pounds from people in, in Fort Yukon, and that was all salmon. That was, that was uh, mostly dried, smoked, or, or, or fresh salmon that was sent back up. And I'll talk a little bit about who those, that, who those relationships uh, those were. And it went all the way down. And, and you know, a number of these were just you know, a single exchange. You know, you know you're going to see somebody at the Gwich'in General Assembly. You know, so you take, some, you take some dried caribou. And it, it's not necessarily the amount or the nutritional value or, or anything like that. Um, it's more that exchange, that, that connection that's made through food. And I remember talking to an elder in Old Crow, talking about his daughter when she was living in Fairbanks and how he couldn't send her any whitefish. And it was, he just wanted to send her two whitefish. And that was not going to get her through the week or through the month or anything, but it was that, that social connection enacted through the exchange of food that was important to him. And you know, he didn't say it that way. But he wanted to maintain that connection with his daughter who was living away from home. And a good way to do that is to share country food. So he talked a lot about that. So a lot of these, you know, not a huge amount. You know, not a huge amount at all. These, these communities up here, these Gwich'in communities, are the more of the significant communities of exchange with, with, the old, with old Crow. Now this is... I, I sometimes get real frustrated with these kind of social network analysis diagrams. You're like, what, what in the world does, does that mean? And you know, sometimes they can get kind of you know, not worth, it, worth the effort. But I think this one is useful, mainly because I did it. But <laughs> this, this shows all the sharing within Old Crow. Okay, so you've got about 105 households in Old Crow. Every one of those households, oh, actually, except for one, uh, who was a brand new teacher and hadn't established those networks yet, was involved in, in food sharing. Okay, so this is what that is. And within Old Crow, there was approximately just shy of 50,000 pounds of meat that circulated throughout that community. Again, we're talking about 105 houses with that kind of meat circulation through there. So the, the amount of food. And in here, I didn't, I didn't capture it. But there's a, there's a couple households that, in terms of network analysis, you would call high centrality. You know, they, they're, the, they're the hub or a focus of a huge amount of food distribution that, that goes out. You know, some households or some harvesters are providing 22 other households with food. So that, that's kind of captured in this. And we're doing work here in, in Nunavik and Labrador and some Cree communities in northern Alberta right now doing very much the same type of work, understanding these local community networks of food distribution. But what I think this does a pretty good job of showing is also the food that, that's leaving. Okay? And you can see these more high density networks you know, going to Whitehorse, going to Fort Yukon, going up to Fort McPherson. Then you see the more kind of peripheral uh, exchanges that occur. 
I, with this, I tried to get rid of a lot of that clutter. And I'm not going to keep throwing. I promise this is almost the last one. Um, but you can see these clusters uh, that, that emerge. So this group of households here in, in black share food with folks in, in uh, Fort Yukon. Okay? And largely kin-based. You know, these are kinship relationships that, that, that form these social, social networks. And you can see the same thing, you know, families that are sharing with Fort McPherson. And we did that for a number of reasons, and kind of outside this. The work we're doing in northern Alberta, we're doing the exact same thing, but we have a spatial component attached to it, saying, okay, well, you harvesters are harvesting, you know, below what's going to be Site C, you know, of hydro development. If you're impacted, your harvesting activities are impacted, how are these other households who are the recipients of your food going to be affected? So we're doing some things like that with these types of social network analyses. Um, so we wanted to see these clusters, okay? This map, I think, is more useful for what we're talking about here, and I hope this is, yeah, it's, it's clear. Um, this is just, obviously, Alaska and the Yukon the border, and I don't have all the communities up here, so the other communities here would be Saskatchewan, Ontario, Vancouver, uh, Victoria, a lot of the other communities that were, there's one or two exchanges down here. But you can see the kind of the, the heart of that distribution network, right? So Old Crow sending food over to Aklavik and Inuvik and Fort McPherson, down to Dawson City and Mayo, you know, a big chunk of that heading down to Whitehorse. But it's not going west. It's not going west at all. And I, I put this up here, and that I know you can't see very well. But traditionally, the folks that Old Crow would be sharing with was Arctic Village, Venati, Chalkitsik, Birch Creek, uh, even Stevens Village, Beaver, and, and Fort Yukon. So these Gwich'in communities traditionally would be the social network that would be exchanging food, uh, exchanging family members to go live for a period of time, but that was, would be the strongest social ties that exist. So when we talk about the effect of the border, I, I personally, when, it, when we showed this up in, well, up in Old Crow, I think this map made, a, made an impact. Because people say, oh yeah, we just can't share the way we used to. Well, a map like this does a pretty good job of showing, no, you can't. You know, there, there's something going on with that, that, that border. And I'll talk about those things in a minute. But, you know, all these communities that you should see considerable, or at least some, exchanges of food going back and forth, you're just not seeing uh, anymore. And that's certainly troublesome to uh, uh, the Vunta. So I just wanted to kind of pull out some of the, kind of the, I guess the specifics around the Old Crow and Fort Yukon food exchange, okay? Because this is, you know, it was the second largest, but we expected to see, see more of it. So it was the second largest volume of wild food shared. It occurred between 18, eight Old Crow households, okay? So a cluster or a social network of eight households shared about 1,600 pounds of food, uh, all caribou with Old Crow, 15 pounds of berries, but essentially it was all, all caribou heading downriver to, to Fort Yukon, uh, to 13 households in, in Fort Yukon. It was shared through 28 ties, so 28 ties uh, uh, or exchanges with immediate family, extended family, and, and friends. Now, I have these grouped in these big categories, but what we actually did, and I think it proved very tedious for uh, community members, but we asked specifically, was it your mother's brother, mother's sister, um, son's, son's daughter. We wanted to be very specific about where, who these exchanges uh, are, are going between. And we're doing that all the way across Canada and Alaska right now to understand what kind of, kind of cultural conditions that might exist that influence these sharing networks. I mean, a lot of this food goes back to the mother. And from the mother, it goes out. And we kind of expected that, but you see these hubs of activity, you know, where sons will get 10 caribou. A lot of it goes back to the mother, who then gives it off to the daughter, the granddaughter, to, to other people in the community. So, and I think that's important to understand, especially in places like Labrador, 
where they're imposing moratoriums and harvesting restrictions, you know, two caribou per household. Well, that doesn't really work in communities like this, you know. So I think understanding those networks are critically important. Uh, in return, and not much food's coming back to Old Crow, uh, but in return, you know, 600 pounds of salmon was sent up. Um, it's an eight uh, for Yukon uh, households. Um, that was done through 25 ties, one uh, immediate family, extended family, and friends. So in terms of, okay, what does the old Crow Fort Yukon sharing pattern, what does that represent in the entire network? I just wanted to put this down. The food share between old Crow and Fort Yukon represents 15% of the total food weight. So of that 14,000 pounds of food that was shared, that, that exchange represents 15% uh, percent, uh, of the total food weight. And what I mean by total food weight is, say, you, you shoot a caribou, and once you process it, you get about 150 pounds of meat. Okay, so you do that calculation of, of edible food weight. 12% uh, of the total household network, so how many households? And there were 191 households that were involved in the Old Crow Food Network. So 191 across the country, um, and 19% of all food exchanges. So it's a significant amount, but you know it's only one community in Alaska. Does that make sense? Okay. No other Alaska community was in, involved with that network, and and we, we saw that we're thinking, okay, well you know what's going on? And we have another project looking at the impact of land claims whether they help support or do they impede wildlife harvesting, looking at ANCSA in Alaska, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and looking up at the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement and say, what role do land claims have actually for promoting environmental livelihoods? And ANCSA in Alaska was very clear with its intentions. It was to move people off the land. Uh, the language in ANCSA was to move people out of subsistence production and into meaningful wage labor jobs. That was, it, it was, it was clear. Um, so we're thinking, well, maybe, you know, 40, 45 years later, has it had an impact? Maybe communities in Alaska, they simply aren't harvesting to the same extent, which I'm sure they're not, but maybe they're not sharing food the same way that, uh, you know, Old Crow does um, because of their different geopolitical relationship. We didn't know. So we had the opportunity, oops, we had the opportunity to go to the 2012 Gwich'in Annual General Meeting that was held in, in Fort Yukon. And this was not a representative sample by any means, but we did a strategic random sample of 20 households that were Gwich'in households that were attending the AGM. Okay, and I, it was strategic because we wanted some representatives from all the villages in Alaska, the Gwich'in villages in Alaska, so Chalkitsik, Arctic Village, Venati, Circle, Fairbanks to a certain extent, Beaver and Birch Creek. So small sample, there's about 450 Gwich'in households in Alaska. We did a, a quick survey of, of only 20 of them just to see what their food sharing networks actually looked like. Okay, so maybe not sharing food with old crows, no big deal, because they're not sharing food with anybody. That wasn't the case. When, when we did this very same methodology about who did you share food with over the past year? Who'd you give to? Who'd you receive? You know, this isn't as clear as that other map, but for example, the household, oops, sorry. Uh, the households that we looked at, we surveyed, Fairbanks, number one, Fairbanks number two, Chalkitsik four, Chalkitsik one, three, two. These households all exchanged food with people in Fort Yukon. So they were, they were actively sharing wild food with people in other villages. The same was true for these other, uh, other villages. Venati, Fort Yukon, um, were all sharing food with Arctic Village. Food was being sent to, to Fairbanks. Food, same with all Chalkitsik. So within this, again, 20 households, there was a huge amount of food moving in between those villages, but it didn't go across that border. You know, it, it stopped at that border with the, those Gwich'in uh, communities in Alaska. So I only fire this, this map up here so you get a sense of where these communities are. Old Crow is just on the other side of the border right, right there. So we kind of confirmed what we thought. We knew 
we suspected there was still a lot of food. I, I used to work in the flats with Koyukon and Gwich'in communities, and I know food moves around the, those villages quite a bit. Politics are sharing. 1993, Old Crow signed their comprehensive land claim. With that, they got a huge amount of territorial rights, hunting rights, territorial rights for, for development, approving development, being engaged in development decisions. And they also talked about the, the right to share food with other communities and other beneficiaries. And I found the language in this very, very interesting in that they're very specific about who you can share wild food with. Um, so the right has been given to the Vantukwachin, given, trade, barter, and sell among themselves and with beneficiaries of adjacent transboundary agreements. So that adjacent transboundary agreements can be the uh, Huachin down in Dawson, it could be the Trondek uh, or Trondek Huachin in Dawson, Nacho Neg Dun uh, in, in the Mayo uh, region, those adjacent transboundary agreements. Okay, so you could share food with those or in lower, or with other Yukon Indian people. And they make very explicit in the language, Canadian beneficiaries, adjacent transboundary agreements, or other Yukon Indian people. Okay? No right has been given to share food with uh, Fort Yukon, Chalkitsuk, any of the other Gwich'in nations that, of, of being their neighbors. That's not saying you can't share food. You can. But you have to get an expert, an export permit to go do that, okay? So if you want to send the, those two whitefish to your daughter in, in Fairbanks, you have to go and fill out the appropriate paperwork to do that, say where it came from, the weight, um, all other details in triplicate, and have that submitted. It kind of takes away from the sharing component a little bit. And they talked about that, but if you want to do it legally, you have to have this permit authorized. No flight, no plane going across the border will take any country food without that permit. Okay? If you get caught with food going across the border, if you're going down the Crow or Porcupine River in Noel Crow and you don't have that permit, your food can be confiscated. And if there's any suspicion that you took that on the Alaska side of the border, they can take your equipment too. Okay? It scares the heck out of people. Okay? Um, if you don't, if you don't get a permit, you say, I'm just doing it, there is a, just a plethora of, of acts and regulations that you, you would be in violation of. So I just, the Yukon Act, uh, Wild Animal and Plant Protection and Regulation of International Interprovincial Trade Act, the Yukon Territorial Wildlife Act. I mean, these acts scare the, rightfully so, scare the heck out of people. And so what, you know, what am I going to do? You know, am I going to fill out all this information so I could go share some food with relatives? No, in, in most case, cases not. To compound, to compound this situation, Old Crow is required to go to the RCMP detachment to get this appropriate, this paperwork filled out. And they have a detachment right, right in Old Crow. And, you know, Old Crow, uh, Vuntuk Wichin have a very good relationship with the RCMP officers in their community. But sometimes you just don't want to go to the RCMP detachment to fill out paperwork for sharing food. And it also lends that kind of um, enforcement role for the, the RCMP to have to go there and, you know, okay, I'm sending this to my brother in Chalkitsik. You know, you just don't want to have that discussion with people um, at, from the RCMP. So that's been a huge, huge deterrent. This uncertainty is, is, is really causing a lot of concern. People just don't even know what the rights are and then, the, then what to go about actually doing things legally. And Jim Magdans in, in Alaska um, has done a lot of really fantastic work on, on food sharing. He talked about the this, this same situation in Western Alaska, where households in Western Alaska, they're so concerned about breaking the rules or laws about barter and trade of country food, they're not doing it. So that uncertainty about your rights and regulations is deterring people from actually doing it. So these were just a, a couple of quotes. And years ago, we used to transport plane loads of caribou. When a village or community wasn't able to harvest, and it went both ways too. Some planes would land here with caribou, and sometimes we would ship planes of caribou meat other places. That is pretty tough to do nowadays. 
when they talked about when the caribou didn't go to Arctic Village, Arctic Village would come to them and, and, and vice versa. You know, when you're so dependent on a migratory species like caribou, you just don't have many luxuries. You've got to go where the caribou is, you've got to, you know, exploit your social networks and access different areas. And that's what they used to do, and that's, that's much harder to do now. This last quote, you know, I make a few trips down to Fort Yukon with boat, but I'm scared to take meat from here down over the border. I was scared to take it down to my relatives. So there's that actual fear, you know, of getting, you know, breaking a law, being, being um, you know, prosecuted uh, for various offenses. And what we found fascinating was this, this social life of stories, too. And I don't know if people, you know, Julie Crookshank's work. But people would talk about incidents of, you know, well, yeah, my, my father went down to Circle and he had ducks in his uh, boat and, and the, the, the warden took them away. Or we took fo food down to Old Crow and the game warden burned all the food on the, uh, on the runway. You're like, really? Yeah, when did this happen? Oh, I think that was 1964, 19, no, 1965. So they were telling these stories as if it was, you know, it's still happening now, but these stories of past events, past run-ins with law or, or issues with the border still continue to have a, have a life of their own. And, they, and people are talking about it as it's, it's a common occurrence today. And that's very powerful. You know, people still talk about those, those events uh, and it influences, you know, how they behave on the, on the land. Okay. Throughout this project, people talked about the hard times are coming. And that's what really facilitated this project and the other two that I mentioned. They talked about we need to prepare ourselves because the hard times are coming. And when we did this work, caribou were plentiful. The caribou came, and there's a hill right behind Old Crow, and the caribou camped out on this hill for weeks. And everyone got caribou. Um, for that reason, we want to go back and do some of the sharing work again. What happens when there isn't a lot of caribou? But the elders said, the caribou are here because they're going away. They're coming to say thanks, and they're going away now. Okay? So everyone is so fearful of what's going to happen. They see what's happening with the Yukon River salmon population. It's just absolutely crashing. They have a self-imposed moratorium to try to help these conditions so they're not harvesting salmon. They're really worried about fluctuations in the, in the porcupine caribou herd. And this picture here, they have no idea what's going on with the climate. This just weeks before was the old cr or, or the crow flats. Okay? Within weeks, it went from lakes, um, you know, Norma here, it would be, you know, overhead in water. It dried up within, within weeks, gone. And some of the aerial photos and people like Murray Humphreys and others are, are looking at the impact. And what, you know, from what I understand, it's not that uncommon for these northern lakes to, to dry up and, and, and shift. But the impact on Norma's family, who traps and traps muskrats and fishes and hunts birds in this area, it's enormous. And when that kind of impact is felt personally, that's huge. That's really huge. So they see all these things going on in the environment with caribou, salmon, waterfowl, climate change, and it's hard to get a real handle on. And, you know, from the, these quotes, people are incredibly concerned. So I, you know, when I submitted my abstract, I framed it as, you know, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And I, I think it still holds true that the U.S. and Canada are now signatories to the de Declaration. Kicking and screaming, nonetheless, they are signatories to the Declaration. And Article 36 assures or is designed to protect those rights of indigenous people who are located along border regions. The Vuntukwachin are a perfect example of a people who live along a border region who are having their rights infringed upon to maintain these social relationships with friends and family in other regions, other adjacent regions. So I think there's an argument to be made, and they plan to make that argument. The second, the second point in, in Article 36 is states in consultation and cooperation with indigenous people shall take effective measures to facilitate and exercise and ensure the implementation of those rights. So the UN is saying, you governments need to work this out with your own indigenous peoples to rectify these situations and ensure these rights aren't being infringed. 
And for a little while, it seemed like, okay, there's a real possibility here. This, this could be pretty exciting. And in March 10th, or March 20, uh, 29th, 2010, Chuck Straw, uh, former Minister of Indian Affairs, and Ken Salazar, Secretary of Interior, met in Whitehorse and they actually signed an MOU to create greater cooperation around these cross-border issues. Certainly a lot, much of it was based on economic development opportunities, but other aspects had a very indigenous rights uh, dimensions to it. And so, you know, within the MOU, the language is uh, the preservation and development of traditional indigenous economies, traditional way of life and unique cultures of indigenous peoples, indigenous land tenure, title planning, law enforcement, and including how related cultural concerns are addressed in indigenous communities located near their shared borders. So with that, with that signing, people think this would be a perfect opportunity to address this issue. And the comments from Salazar, our strength and collaboration will help to improve the quality of life for American Indians and Alaska Natives and indigenous peoples throughout the United States and Canada. I mean, that's awfully promising. Unfortunately, not much has been done to address the concerns of the Vuntuk Chin. And I'll go back to some, but I was putting some slides together for this last night, and I, I was sitting there, and these two pictures that I just showed, I think, su sums up almost every interaction that I've had with it between Aboriginal leaders and government representatives for the past 15 years. So you have very happy, enthusiastic, <laughs> Um, and this is a cheap shot, you know, there, you know, but you look at that and you look at that image. Then you see the reality on these faces right here. And, you know, it's like, yeah, we've heard that before. You know, I, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but they still have these same concerns. Despite all the, all the excitement around this MOU and what can be done to address indigenous issues on, on, in border regions, we still can't trade and barter and bring back food to things over the border like we did years, years ago. We need to put pressure on Indian Affairs to get some kind of agreement made. You know, I think there's, there's this sense that five years later, nothing really is going to get done on the border issue. And, uh, you know, maybe for a small Wachin community like Old Crow, 300 people, it's just not on anybody's radar. But in reality, these guys are living, you know, we can't necessarily do anything about climate change or what's going on with the Crow Flats, but the border seems like something that, that is manageable. Something, something could be done. And this last quote, you know, it was, I, I think it was, it was a fantastic quote. You know, and, and an elder got up and expressed this with such elegance and he was so articulate and he started, started talking about it. It was essentially a nation building. Um, you know, uh, priority that, you know, we need to do it. We're the Gwich'in nation. We need to do this our, ourselves and we need to be respected by the U.S., Canada, all, all nations if they're going to take care of their own affairs. And, you know, we're sitting in these workshops and you can see that kind of that power and that the AGM in, in Fort Yukon, they talk about we need to be the Gwich'in nation. You know, if I want to share caribou with my daughter in Fairbanks, I have every, every right to do it. And you can see that, that, that excitement and that, that, that sense of self-governing actually, um, you know, be expressed. So this takes me back to my original comment with the, with the food security work we were doing. Up until this point, I really didn't know if food sovereignty really had any real meaning for Aboriginal communities in, in, in Canada. You know, do, do you actually have the power to exercise that type of authority over your food system? And maybe for the Tall Cree or Little Red River Cree who I'm working with up in northern Alberta, maybe not. Maybe, maybe they are powerless at defining their own, own food systems. But for a community like Old Crow, who are still very dependent on, on wild resources, migratory uh, wild resources, maybe having that, that, that food security, that aspect of foods or food sovereignty over their livelihood system could make this small community very food secure into the future. It would, at the very least, in, improve their, improve their uh, local conditions. So I just thought I'd end with that. You know, food, for the Vunta Kuchin, food sovereignty is all about food security. And for them to be able to define their, their rights and relationships with, with the Kuchin in, in Alaska. So I'll s stop there. And so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
We just uh, we submitted a Brenda Parlay is uh, just edited a book through UBC Press and it should be out real soon and uh, talked about managing these migratory populations across borders like this and we submitted a, a paper that touches on some of this and one of the reviewers said okay what's the what's the advice for these co-managers you know how, how can these new boards these um, uh, address issues of, of food sharing and uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about it. You know, would, would the Porcupine Caribou Management Board, for example, be the, the institution to try to address some of these issues? And we came to the conclusion that it's not. I mean, while it's certainly a, a powerful advisory body, it didn't have the, the power legislatively to interact with uh, Homeland Security in, in the U.S. or the Department of Interior in, in the U.S. And these different scales of bureaucracy it was, it was just one of many that Vunta have to try to negotiate with. I don't think they're giving up on it. You know, I think that that might be a potential vehicle to, to include, but it alone, I think it's, it might be limiting. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you put the uh, meat that the people are sharing. Uh, pound doesn't make sense to me, but... <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, it's a how, lot. How, 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 did you, how did you weigh? Grams. There you go. <laughs> What's that? How did you weigh? Um, did you weigh all the meat? Um, yeah, what we did was in these food, ser food sharing surveys that are done all, across the north, you say, you know, in the past year, what food have you, you given, for example? And it's a hard question, you know, and in a lot of ways it's, it's ballparked. Um, but people are pretty aware of like caribou. They know how much care, how many caribou they got, and how much was given away or how much was received. And you've done there's calculations that exist. Like I said, for a for a caribou in Alaska, Yukon, roughly if you harvest it and you process it, you know, you butcher it, you're going to get about 150 pounds of meat. For a moose, you know, somewhere between like 465 pounds. Of meat and there's calculations now what we did do we spent time because a lot of this meat is dried okay and we wanted to convert it to to raw weight we spent time drying meat so drying caribou to see what the raw what you know when it's dried how much how much water do you lose so actually you get 10 pounds of raw meat equals about one pound of of dried meat so yeah, so but there's a, been a lot of good work on doing these edible weight conversions, and they've done it for every region of the North, depending on the different characteristics of caribou or moose or whitefish. Or, does that answer? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, second question is: You show the uh, network diagram, uh, the food sharing network diagram, and uh, uh, some you show the some centrality, centralities. Yeah. Uh, um, so you mean uh, there are some uh, social inequalities? Oh yeah. Um, so that, that's why you have some some people have more uh, more networks. Than you bet. Networks. Yeah, and um, you'll see that in any community, you know, food distribution. There's there's not necessarily equity in food distribution. You know, there's certainly some people, you know, a very active harvester will provide for the immediate family uh, quite a bit. We just, fit, we're, we're on, involved in a project, right, we, uh, up at uh, Little Red River, where you've worked. We did food sharing in Jean Dor Prairie, which is a road accessible community, and Fox Lake, which is right across the road. And the density of sharing is so much different. You know, there's probably 30, Households in Jean Dor that don't receive any food from they're on the margins. They don't they don't get any, any food at all Fox Lake completely different, but even within this network here You'll see people who you know, are on the margins. They'll, they'll get some meat. They won't be be left uh, But they're they're not a you know very central to the to the network so whether you could characterize that as social capital or or some other term Where the meat actually ended up after it had been shared and shared again. But could you do that? 
I think we could. Yeah. I mean, one thing we've done, we have a very large sample or a survey sample from Alaska to Labrador, about 3,500 households. And we're looking at uh, participation in harvesting and barriers to harvesting, trying to see you know, what populations, depending on what region you're in, uh, are, are more susceptible to being food insecure. The problem is, you know, we're working up with some communities in, in Nunavik, for example, and I think we have a very, you know, in the West, and this is not my, it, this is a well-known criticism, the way we think about household food insecurity. And these households here, they're, it's a, more, more accurate to say a dwelling than a household. And you have multiple dwellings cooperating. You know, people might sleep under different roofs, but they're essentially a, the same household. So if anyone's ever spent time in any, you know, northern villages, you know, like around supper time or meal time, people start rolling in, you know, there's, there's a flow of people in and out, people sit down and help themselves to food. Is that sharing? Yeah, but that's really hard to capture, you know, every time you go over to mom's house and have, have some seal or caribou, you know, so, so that's real hard. Like we found, you know, some of the, the big surveys they do across the Arctic go in and go into a, a, a single mother's house and look in the cabinet and say, oh, you don't have enough food for, you know, to support you for a day. Well, yeah, that's probably true if you look up on those shelves, but, you know, mom's right across the road. And so I think there's, I think there's so much to do around these different gender dimensions around food security that we're, we're not doing a very good job. So a lot of research, I guess. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, two uh, questions. The first question, just out of curiosity, the table that you have on the weights uh, yeah. in exchange, other than uh, border crossing, were there any discussions with any data that you have talked about the quantity of food, whether it's been uh, increased or decreased over time? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, unfortunately we don't have that longitudinal data. Yeah. And when we uh, came out of this project, like I said, caribou were coming out of people's ears that year. They were all over. And so everyone had meat. So does that mean everyone's sharing? you know, meat. So is that typical? And we wanted desperately to go back. And that's a, that's kind of an academic question. So I had a hard time saying why we needed to go back, you know, because people say we share what we have, you know, so is it the same networks, but lesser amounts? Is it different species? You know, so I think there's, that's the one thing we're, we're lacking is that longitudinal data, how these social networks respond to ecological changes. You know, do you just confine your networks? Say, you know, I don't have a I don't have enough to give, you know, I'm just not giving. And I think in some of the Dene communities in northern Alberta and um, in the Cree communities, we're starting to see that. You know, there's just not enough moose. And a friend of mine was doing some work with Dene Ta and he told me of one of the funniest lines that he was with a, a fella who took some uh, moose over to another guy and the guy's response was, Does didn't this moose have any ribs? So, I mean, so there's that kind of tension, you know, and I've been with young hunters who they're not intentionally hiding it, but they're not making it publicly known that they have moose. And there's almost, there's a, I don't want to say a sense of shame, but embarrassment because you want to, you want to share. But when you know you got a bunch of little mouths in that house, as well as a mom and dad and other people within your network, you, know, you, you, you can't just spread it out as, as, as the way you would like. So I think what you, you hit on, a, I think, a really important question. And I know some folks up in Alaska who have really good relationships with some uh, north, uh, the north Coast communities are doing that same thing. They're, doing, they're hoping to do three years in a row of what, the, what do these networks look like. Yeah. You had a second question? I do have a second question. So the last slide you said, the statement said, food sovereignty is food security. I thought it might um, sound good. Yeah. Because food security is a, is a bigger picture. It's you not, bet. You bet. Yeah, like contaminants affects food quality. You know, no, you're right. Income and all that. But that that wouldn't have been a nice summary statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 
just a little subtitle or footnote that, you know. By the way, it's really complex. And, you know. <laughs> no, but you're right. But if you ask some people up in, in Old Crow, and I don't think, you know, I think this would be a, you know, it's, it's tough today, you know, because you do need the money to go out and, and, and harvest and all these complexities. But you, people, some people feel they're much better off when they had that, that freedom of mobility and, and, you know, I don't know, but you're right. It's, it's not as simple just having control over your food system by any means. So, yeah. Yeah. Explain that to me. I'm a like, culture like anthropologist. Like a population that acts as a source for another, and then if there's like metapopulations in a network. Yeah. I haven't thought about that, but that sounds pretty cool. Yeah, so I, if you did that, then you could also have it rely on climate change yeah. the way that you do with population numbers. Yeah. See, I think, I, I think that's, you hit on something really good. If a lot of people are doing this kind of work across the north from Labrador, or they've been doing Alaska for a while, but I'm not convinced it goes much beyond this level. I mean, I, I put some networks up here and it, it could be interesting, but I think there's some pretty rich data that could be used that if you could link it to some other, uh, you know, other ecological changes or, or make, you know, these ecological communities and social communities interactions, I think it could go to a whole different level of type of analysis. I mean, so I can't say I understand completely what you just said, but it sounded great. <laughs> so, but I, but I think that's where this kind of work needs to, needs to go. And I think it could be really, really useful to the communities. And, and, and to advance social network analysis for sure. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Oh. I think I'm going to end us there. Um, if we have, do we have time for one more round here? Well, why don't we continue it upstairs? That's what I'm so, thinking. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank you, David, for well, coming and my talking tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.